Good morning and blessings to everyone on this Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. I am Pastor Ann Gregory, the pastor of the English language service now, and uh, it seems that our normal worship leader and our normal pianist are not able to be with us this morning. And so it, I may well be the worship leader and the prayer leader and the preacher and uh, the singing leader. So um, thanks be to God. And Ajahn Nara is playing the piano for us this morning. So we pray that we may all experience God's blessing during this worship time of joy and solemn remembrance, both. If this is the first time you are worshiping with us, or if you have a prayer request or, or a word of thanksgiving, please let us know, or you may place a note in the offering. Let us turn to God with a full heart and let us read responsively the words of the call to worship as found in your bulletin. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. As we sing together our two Palm Sunday hymns, these hymns are hymns as if we are following Christ as he comes into the city of Jerusalem riding on a donkey. And so the palms that we have been given, we would wave them as we sing the hymns together. So please stand and be prepared to sing Hosanna, loud Hosanna, followed by all glory, laud, and honor. Children sang through 
remain standing, if you're able, as we read the words from the Gospel of Matthew regarding that morning, Palm Sunday, from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this. The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Please be seated for the opening prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you came into the holy city, not on a war horse and with your generals at your side, but on a donkey, a sign of a king coming in peace. Born the prince of peace, you showed yourself every time as the prince of peace. And we call ourselves your followers. Yet we do not love peace as much as we say we do. Give us the courage and the grace to follow you into Holy Week, remembering your promise of forgiveness, salvation, and resurrection. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The prayers we pray for the church and the world come from the Book of Common Prayer this morning. Let us turn once again to God in prayer. O oh God, we pray for your universal church, that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all ministers and leaders that they may be faithful to your word and your service. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all we do, that our works may be blessed in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress. Have mercy on us as we pray for our own needs and those of others. Let us take a moment of silence together for those prayers. Through Christ we pray, amen. As our Lord taught us, so we pray together. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. The service of Palm Sunday begins with joy. Jesus comes into the city of Jerusalem in a kind of parade, and the people around him try to make the road clear and soft as they would for a very, very important ruler. People are excited, and people are even hopeful that this is some sign that they will be freed from the occupying forces of a foreign power, the Romans. People are wondering if this will be the start of a new freedom. And yes, it is, but in a way very different from what they were expecting. And those who know the story of Holy Week know what happened in the days following. Jesus was arrested. He was put on trial. He suffered. He died. So our service today changes from rejoicing to quiet reflection as we end the service today. We will not rejoice again until Easter Day next week. But even when he knew trouble was coming, Jesus said these words to his disciples, and these words are found in the Gospel of John. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I give to you not as the world gives. Don't be troubled or afraid. So let us together, if you are able, stand again and greet one another, first the stranger and then the friend, by saying the peace of Christ be with you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come into his, this Holy Week, we see once again that God reverses what the world expects. The world hopes for and expects victory and power for our own group. But in Jesus Christ, God brings love for the world, not just for some. So much love that whoever believes in Christ will receive eternal life. O oh God, open our ears and hearts to hear your truth and receive your grace. Amen. Many churches on Palm Sunday morning will read the whole of what is called as the Passion Gospel. It takes longer than a sermon to read it aloud. But this morning, we will look once again at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 15 to 26. 
This comes from the Common English Bible translation. It was customary during the festival for the governor to release to the crowd one prisoner, whomever they might choose. At that time, there was a well-known prisoner named Jesus Barabbas. When the crowd had come together, Pilate asked them, whom would you like me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus who is called Christ. He knew that the leaders of the people had handed him over because of jealousy. While Pilate was serving as judge, his wife sent this message to him. Leave that righteous man alone. I've suffered much today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and kill Jesus. The governor said, which of the two do you want me to release to you? Barabbas, they replied. Pilate said, then what should I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And now I want you all to join with me in the shout. They all said, crucify him. But he said, why? What wrong has he done? Again, I ask you to join me. They shouted even louder, crucify him. Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere and that a riot was starting. So he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your problem. All the people replied together, let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus whipped, and then... He handed him over to be crucified. How many of you know this story well, the story of Barabbas? I've always thought in my life that Barabbas meant something bad, that it, was, that it was a bad name. But recently I learned that in the Hebrew language, the language of the children of Israel, Barabbas means the son of the father. I don't know why that didn't occur to me. I did study Hebrew in seminary. But Abba in the Bible means father. That's the Hebrew language, Abba. And Bar means son. You might remember in Matthew, the 16th chapter, Jesus calls his disciple Peter Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, son of God. And so this prisoner, Bar Abbas, his first name was Jesus. Jesus Bar Abbas was the prisoner. I wonder why Matthew's gospel tells this part of the story. It is not in the other gospels. 
except Mark says something, the Gospel of Mark, says something about releasing a prisoner. But Matthew is the only place that gives a name, Barabbas, Barabbas. So, this is something that we might not understand unless we study it deeply. Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, asks the crowds whether he should release Jesus, the son of his father, or Jesus the Christ, which means the anointed one, Messiah. How are we supposed to tell the difference? What does it mean? Jesus, the son of the father? Don't, don't we think of Jesus Christ as Jesus, the son of the father, and then Jesus the Christ? What's the difference? Why is Matthew making them sound so much alike? Why do their names sound so much like each other? The best we can understand is that Matthew's gospel is reminding us of a king who comes in peace, not a warrior. The people already knew that Barabbas was, was a murderer and a seditionist, what today the newspapers would call a terrorist. This is what Jesus Barabbas was, a terrorist. He was a warrior. He was hoping to conquer through violence. But the people knew very well in those days that a king who came into the city as a conquering warrior, as a man of violence, came on a horse, riding a horse into the city. And if a king came into the city in peace, he always rode on a donkey. The people knew that. But the people wanted a man of war. They wanted a man who would come and conquer, just like people in every nation and every century. And we still, we still all want a man of war. We still want someone who will conquer with an army. But if we are to give our lives to the God who is revealed in Jesus Christ, if we are to give our lives to the God of Jesus the Anointed One, Jesus the Messiah, if we are to commit our lives in a holy way, we are going to have a different kind of leader. We are going to have a different understanding of the God of the universe. And we are going to have a different way of arranging our lives and our systems, our groups, our organizations, our families, our friendships. We can choose to put our trust in government by force and by what helps the powerful to remain powerful. Or we can promise our loyalty to a completely different system, a system that heals, a system that prays for our enemies and prays that everything would change so that enemies can become friends, partners. We can promise our lives to a system that does not use force or violence on anyone. We can pledge our lives to a system in which the leaders are servants who suffer for the followers. There have been a few leaders like this in history, very few. 
The story is very well known in England and in many parts of the Christian Church in the western part of the world. The story of the Archbishop Thomas Becket. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury in England and he was murdered by the king's men at the communion table in the cathedral while he was leading a service of Holy Communion, he was murdered by the king's men. This was about a thousand years ago. And after they killed him, they learned that under his silk robes, under his beautiful, beautiful robes as the Archbishop of Canterbury, the top chief pastor in the church there, under his robes, he was wearing something called a hair shirt. A hair shirt is something that is made of animal hair, usually goat's hair, and it is designed to be uncomfortable. It's something that has been used throughout history and in many different cultures as a sign of repentance as a way of drawing closer to God through physical pain. Most Christians today do not encourage it, but it is very similar to what the Old Testament talks about when those who are in great sorrow before God would put on what's called sackcloth and put ashes on their heads, wearing something uncomfortable to remind themselves of who is God and who is not God. We don't recommend that today. But in that day, it was much respected. In that day, it was also learned after the archbishop was killed that he had lived in a very small room, not the beautiful rooms of an important man, the way people thought it would be. He lived in a very small room like the humblest of his monks. He had done all these things so that he would never forget the suffering of what the Bible calls the least of these. And not long after that time, King Henry II of England, the king whose men had killed the archbishop, walked through the city of Canterbury on bare feet as a sign of repentance and sorrow for the assassination of a servant leader. Apparently, the king had not really wanted his men to kill the archbishop. They just thought that he had. And very, very soon after that time, the Church of England made Thomas Becket into a saint. And not just the Church of England, but the Christian Church. And Canterbury became a place of pilgrimage, and it is still known that way today, a place where people would travel to look for a spiritual experience of God. And today, and for centuries now, the chief pastor of Canterbury, the Archbishop, is always the top pastor of the Church of England. It has been said that many Christians praise Jesus on Sundays, but they try to destroy him during the week. We do not always do as Thomas Becket did. We still neglect to care for those who are weak, who have little or no power. We too often ignore the least of these, and we often pledge ourselves, we promise ourselves and give our lives to systems that are too quick to torture the weak and to shed blood and to do violence and to conquer through force. We too easily promise ourselves to that kind of a system 
rather than a system that heals and serves others, even those who are not considered important. The Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Philippians in chapter 2, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. Let your mind be like Jesus Christ. He was the most powerful. He was God in human form. But he did not use force or violence to make other people do things his way. Instead, he gave everything away and he became like a slave of those times and served others. And he became a human being and did not use power and force or violence. Instead, it was used against him. So, if we were the crowd that day in front of the governor, the governor Pontius Pilate, which prisoner would we want to release? Jesus, the son of his father, or Jesus the Christ, the anointed one? Do we want to release the one who trusts in violence? Or do we want to release the one who comes to heal the broken, the one who comes to suffer for us. Let us pray together a prayer that comes from India. Jesus, King of the universe, ride on in humble majesty. Lord, this Palm Sunday, may I recognize in you the Lord who comes to his world. And may I join with a full heart in the children's Hosanna. Ride on, King Jesus. Ride on through conflict and debate. Ride on through sweaty prayer and the betrayal by friends. Lord, this Palm Sunday, forgive me my evasions of truth. Forgive me my carelessness about your honor. Forgive me my weakness, which leaves me sleeping while even in others you suffer and are anguished. Forgive me my cowardice that will not risk publicly acknowledging you as Lord. Ride on to the empty tomb and your rising in triumph. Ride on to raise up your church, a new body for you in service. Ride on, King Jesus, to renew the whole earth in your image. In compassion, King Jesus, come to help us. Amen.
That Palm Sunday morning, the crowds were joyful. They cheered the man who rode into the city on a humble donkey. They hoped that he would bring great changes with him. And he did. Great changes did come through giving everything, even his dignity and then his life. Death was conquered once and for all. What will we give? Will we also humble ourselves and give what we have to serve others in his name? Trusting in God's astonishing love, we bring our tithes and offerings. And during this time of offering, we will sing together the first three stanzas of Go to Dark Gethsemane as found in your bulletin. Let us turn again to prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, the gifts we have brought are a symbol of our faith. But giving them to your service is itself an act of faith. In this holy week, when we remember that your disciples all ran away, give us the strength and the hope to turn again to you, trusting that all your ways are the ways of giving. Amen. Let us stand and sing together the doxology. Praise. 
Please be seated. I missed the announcements, and so I will share them with you now. There are a number of worship services during this Holy Week coming. Maundy Thursday, someone was asking me what Maundy means. It comes from the Latin word mandate, which is, it means command. Christ Jesus commanded his disciples at the Last Supper to wash one another's feet. And when they shared bread and wine, to do it in remembrance of him. And so that is Maundy Thursday. That service uh, is at 7 p.m. In the sanctuary here, there will be worship and communion in the Thai language and translation at the same time into English. Good Friday, we have a misprint in the bulletin. That worship service is also at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary, once again in the Thai language and translated into English. Holy Saturday at 8 a.m., there is a service of remembrance. Um, I have it at the cemetery, but it is here in the sanctuary. And then Easter Sunday at 6 o'clock in the morning, there is a sunrise service here in the Thai language. Our English congregation will meet as we have done for a long time at 9 in the morning and celebrate together the resurrection in a worship service that all other worship services are planned after the service of Easter Day. Our events today, uh, we do have a time of sharing tea and coffee in the Mana Dining Hall afterwards, and everyone is invited. We cannot become community if we don't talk to each other. At 10.30, there is a Bible study class, and John Wachi is not present today, and I will be leading that class in the McFarland building from 10.30 until lunchtime. There is lunch. All are welcome for lunch, served in the dining hall behind the building. And then today, this afternoon, I ask for your prayers, particularly for the leaders of Watana, many of the elders who are supportive of the English service and some other leaders will be present together this afternoon for a meeting to seek a vision for where God is leading this congregation. We also ask your prayers for safe travels for Ajahn Motan Konyak, who is normally the coordinator of our services, and he will be returning from India this week. So. Pray for his safe travel. If you have, again, any requests for prayer or concerns, uh, you may give them to one of the ushers or to me or another leader after the service. Let us stand together again for the final hymn and the final prayer when I survey the wondrous cross.
May the God of peace make you perfect and holy. And may you be kept safe and blameless, spirit, soul, and body, for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has called you, and God will not fail you. Amen.